Many of us know all too well what it is like to be unjustly criticized for our actions or for our motives or for our beliefs. And many of us have experienced the hurt and the pain that comes when our name, and more importantly, when the name of Christ has been dragged through the mud by those lies. And that pain has been even more devastating when it has come from those that we love, from those that we trust, and from those who claim to love Jesus Christ. And we sometimes refer to that public expression of condemnation as bad press. And in the city of Corinth, the Apostle Paul was receiving bad press. He was being falsely accused of imp impure motives, uh, of a hidden agenda in his work for Christ in that city. He was being falsely accused of hidden sin in his life by false teachers who had found their way into the church fellowship in Corinth. And he was being unjustly criticized of inaccurately presenting the truth of the word of God to the people there. And to a certain degree, I guess the, the letter of 2 Corinthians was written by Paul in response to that condemnation, in response to that bad press. So beginning in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in an attempt to clear the air concerning some of these things, Paul says we, we all live in the shadow of death. And each day that we wake up is a gift from God because it may be our last day on this earth. So, he tells us, I want to number my days. I want to make each day of my life count for Christ. So I prioritize my life in order to accomplish that goal. This is my ambition. And I think that even that word ambition has gotten some bad press over the years, hasn't it? And some of it is certainly justified. When the Romans, at the time that Paul wrote this letter, used the word ambition, they used it to describe anyone who would use any means that was necessary to achieve their objectives without any thought at all to what was right or what was good or, or what was ethical. And even today, ambition is associated with Selfishness, it's associated with ruthlessness and with a lack of morality. But that is not the way that Paul used this word. He used the word philatameomai in Greek, which means to love what is honorable, to aspire to what is excellent to what brings glory to Christ. Therefore, Paul says in verse 9, we have this as our ambition. This is what drives our behavior above all else. So whether we are at home in this body, on this earth, or we are absent from this body and we are in the glory of heaven, our ambition does not change. Wherever we are, wherever we may be, 
we seek to be pleasing to the Lord. You arestas in Greek. We want to do well for him in every area of our life. And at this point, we, we just might stop for a moment and ask ourselves this question. As those who belong to Jesus Christ, is that the greatest ambition in our life? To do well for him? Or have other ambitions, other pressures in our life taken priority over that desire? That is something to, to think about, isn't it? As we are instructed by the Lord in Jeremiah 45, 5, where he says, Are you seeking great things for yourself? Do not seek them, but seek to do that which is acceptable to the Lord, devoted to him in all things. Because in the end, that is the only press that will matter. Since in the end, we are accountable to him, to him alone. For we who belong to the Lord must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul reminds us in verse 10. The bema in Greek, a raised platform where rewards were given to victorious athletes. A raised platform where the true character of our lives will be revealed before our Savior. And it is there that we will see what he already knows about us. It's there that all that we are, all that we have done for him as believers will be revealed. Our true motives, our, our hidden attitudes, our priority, and only those things that have eternal value will remain forever. So that each one of us, it says, who belongs to him may be recompensed. Kamidso in Greek. That we may receive back what is due to us for our deeds that we have done while we have been in this body on this earth according to what we have done, whether it is good, it says in verse 10, agathos in Greek, but it's more than good, whether it was excellent, whether it was for the glory of Christ, or, it says, whether it was bad, phalos, in Greek, it is not so much morally bad, but whether it was worthless, whether it was useless. Did we spend all of our time, all of our energy, while we were here on this earth on things that had no eternal value? That certainly is a compelling question to consider. And while it is true that our lives certainly are a combination of things that are excellent, that are eternal, and a combination of things that are worthless, on the day that we stand before Christ, he will sort out all of those things for us. The truth will be made known to us. Therefore, Paul says in verse 11, knowing, understanding the fear of the Lord, phalas 
in Greek, aware that our lives are lived before the very God of the universe. We stand in awe of him. We have no life apart from him, so we are careful to live our lives before him in a way that might please him. Because who can stand against him? Who can, who can prevail over him? Who can deceive him? So, knowing these things, Paul says, we persuade men. Pytho in Greek. We make every effort to bring the truth of Jesus Christ to them. Truth that has been entrusted to us we desire to bring it with honesty. We want to bring it with clarity and we want to bring it with integrity. But whether men or women believe what we preach or not, it is still the truth. God is aware of what we do. We are made manifest to him, it says. Phanerao in Greek. He clearly sees our heart. He, he knows our motives. He knows everything about us. He knows that we are men and women who desire to live before him in integrity, seeking to honor him. And I hope and pray, Paul adds, that we are also made manifest in your consciences, that in your mind and in your heart, our integrity will be clear to you, that you can see that we are committed to the truth of Christ, that we are committed to live for him. But he says in verse 12, we are not commending ourselves to you, are we? We're not doing that again, sunes to me in Greek. Do we need to defend ourselves? Do we need to establish our validity, our credibility among you again? Do we? Paul says no. But we are giving you an occasion. Ah, farme, we're giving you an opportunity to be proud of us. Cow, ama, we're giving you the opportunity to speak for us. We're giving you the opportunity to give us some good press, knowing us as, as well as, as you do, that you may have an answer for those among you who take pride in their appearance, prosopon, who take pride in themselves, who, who take pride in how they appear before men. And they don't care. They don't care how they appear before God. They, they don't care how, what God sees in their heart. So speak, Paul says. Speak on our behalf. Testify to our integrity and silence this bad press. For if we are beside ourselves, he says in verse 13, existe me in Greek, if we are burning with fervor and we're over the top with passion in our convictions, well then it is for God, it is for Christ that the truth might be heard. But on the other hand, he adds, if we are of sound mind, so phraneo in Greek, if we are calm and gentle and restrained, maybe even laid back a little, he says it's for you. It is for your sakes that we might move you along the path of salvation with patience in your relationship with Christ. So in every situation, 
in every circumstance. Paul says it is the love of Christ, his love for us that controls us. Suneko in Greek. His love holds us together. His love influences our conduct. His love for us compels us to express our gratitude to him by living for him. Having concluded this, he says, this one fact, the reality of the truth that he is the one, he alone is the one who has died as a sacrifice for us, for us all. Therefore, all who have put their faith in him have died to sin. Sin no longer has dominion over us since Christ has paid the penalty for that sin with his own blood so that now, now we might live for God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if that is bad press to the world, so be it. It is certainly good press for us. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Berean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.